Good afternoon and welcome to the Salvation Army Frontline Live. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Dean Pallant. I'm the Secretary for Communications and we're just so pleased that you've been able to join us this afternoon. We're going to be having an in-depth look at modern slavery and the Salvation Army's response. Uh, I'm being joined in the studio here with two uh, colleagues who are staff members in our team, but also with, uh, from Dan. Dan is a survivor of modern uh, slavery and we're really privileged to have Dan with us today. But starting off our time together is uh, Major Kathy Betridge. Kathy, welcome. Hello, thank you. So Kathy, tell me about uh, your, your work for the Salvation Army. So I'm the director for our anti-trafficking and modern slavery unit within the United Kingdom and Ireland Territory. And uh, I have a number of teams that work within the area of modern slavery and anti-trafficking. So we have a team that looks after our government contract that we've been successful and we were awarded. Uh, we have a team that looks after and works with all our safe houses and our outreach support. We have a team that works with our survivor support fund and all our volunteers, the um, volunteer drivers and the first responders, as well as um, engaging with our local Salvation Army churches and centres um, as well. So there's a lot of activity going on within there's our unit. A lot, there's a lot involved. Now, what I should have said to you a few moments ago, friends, is that you're welcome to comment and to give us your questions. And we'd love to hear questions. When you hear Kathy or one of the folks say something and you think it's interesting, just pop a, cop a comment in the chat. So my first question to you, Kathy, is just to help us understand what do we mean by modern slavery and human trafficking? Well, it, it's not modern, it's not new. It, it has been going on for a long time, despite all the work that Wilbur, Will, William Wilberforce um, did. Yes. But it, it, it's around the fact that um, somebody has moved from a place, um, so their country, into another country. And very often they've been conned, they've been tricked into the offer of maybe education or a, um, a job opportunity. Uh, and then when they arrive in the country, they, they never get that. They're, they're taken into some kind of forced criminality, sexual exploitation, um, and they never see that money. So therefore they become slaves, they become enslaved, and they're in debt, and they're treated very, very badly, and then their lives are threatened, as are the lives of their families. And it's happening all around us. Yes, and it's not just people crossing borders, is it? It's not, no. We have a number of our own British nationals who are now um, in our service, and, and that, that those numbers have grown. Yes. So why does the Salvation Army do this work? Well, it's something that we've, we've again we've done since since our, you know our, our founded, founding days back in the 1800s. Um, so we were then very much a voice, um, recognizing that women and children were sold. Then we were a source country back then. We're now a destination country, mm -hmm. but the Salvation Army has, has always had that voice for for the marginalised, for the vulnerable. And we, we speak into government. We did then. We spoke into government about the age of consent, which was 13. We, it was it was raised to what it is now, 16. Um, but but it, it's something we've always done. We value human life, and, and this this criminal activity, um, you know, makes people feel totally worthless, totally devalued, and therefore it's important that we are involved in it. And our partnership with government is is very important, isn't it? Because so we, just talk talk to me a bit about that partnership, and and, and is it for England and Wales? It is, yes. This this contract covers England and Wales. Um, we, we've been working with, with the government um, for, for, for a number of years now, since 2011. And last June, we were successful to um, be awarded the, the new Modern Slavery Victim Care contract. And what that does is it, it entitles somebody to the ECAT entitlement. So they're, they're given safe house accommodation if that's what they need, or outreach support, medical care, um, translation service, m you know, money, a, a weekly um, amount of payment to, to help them to live and also the opportunity to just start to reflect and recover so that they can then build their lives again and in some cases move back to their country from where they've come or not if it's dangerous. They, they build their lives in this country and our work helps them to do that. Now we don't just do this contract on our own, we, we have partners, so can you tell, tell us a little bit, little bit about the partners and also the, the scope of the work? How many people are we, are we working with? Yeah, so we, we have a number of um, partners that, we ha that, that provide this um, safe house and outreach support. So we have uh, 12 subcontractors, and we as a Salvation Army are also a subcontractor with safe houses. We work with the police, we work with border force, we work with local authorities, because we need to ensure that somebody who's moving on from our service can integrate into community life and, and have you know, safe house housing for themselves. Um, the, the numbers that we're working with, well, over the, the time we've had the contract, we're looking at over 12 
12,000 wow. and, and in 12 and a half thousand at least, but they're only those that have come into our service. So there will be many others um, that we don't know about yet and who are trapped and, and enslaved. Yes, and is the problem increasing or, or plateauing? How, how do you see it? it? Well, the numbers are, are increasing, yes. um, and I think because the public are more aware of it, um, there's, there's, there's a clear identification of somebody who, who might have you know, recognised that this, a, a person could potentially be a, a victim. We're also very aware that, that our, the, the partners that we're working with, as in the police and others, are also more, more aware of this now. So, so people are, are, are being identified and coming into the service. And some of those individuals are identifying themselves as well and, and self-referring you know, self -referring. them in. Yeah. Well, we have a film now uh, about modern slavery, so let's watch the film. Nearly 46 million people, men, women and children, are living in slave-like conditions in the world today. Tens of thousands of them are here in the UK, forced into a life of slave labour, domestic servitude and sexual exploitation. They are in our towns, communities and businesses. Many are away from view, others are hidden in plain sight and many people never realise this cruel practice is taking place right under their noses. Good morning, Salvation Army Anti-Trafficking. Since 2011, the Salvation Army has been appointed by the UK government to manage the care of men and women who have been through this horrific ordeal. The Salvation Army work very closely with the government. From the moment the police decide to carry out a raid, they will communicate with the Salvation Army and we will be there at the forefront to be available to assist victims. When potential victims are found, they are taken to a safe place by Salvation Army volunteers. The Salvation Army runs a network of safe houses across England and Wales. Here they're provided with support to begin to recover and rebuild their lives. Anything you need, you just come down and see us, all right? We work closely with a number of subcontractors to provide that support across England and Wales. And that support can include financial or legal assistance, medical treatment or counselling. If they wish to return to their home countries, the Salvation Army will give them support. If they are UK citizens or are entitled to stay in the UK, the Salvation Army will help them find somewhere to live, a job or training to prepare for work. Thanks to donations that we receive, we have something called the Victim Care Fund, and that Victim Care Fund will provide financial assistance to victims outside the contract, supporting individuals into educational courses or receive specialist treatments, as well as assisting with rent deposits, for example, when, when they leave our services. The work to combat modern slavery doesn't stop here in the UK. The Salvation Army is working through its international projects to raise awareness of the risks in places where people are particularly exposed to trafficking. The Salvation Army work within communities across the world to ensure that they aren't victims of slavery. Modern slavery and human trafficking, it's something that desperately needs to be clamped out and we will be at the forefront of that um, and, and one day it will happen. powerful information there and if you have questions that you'd like us to answer uh, please do pop them in the chat and we'll be happy to come to those. Cathy, um, tell me a little bit about the people, more about the people we are supporting. Mm. So they come from different countries, we've probably got about 90 nationalities um, that we've 90. supported, 90. Wow. Um, so one of the top countries is, is Albania, and women in particular for sexual exploitation. But interestingly, this year, um, Britain, Brit our British nationals, ha has has come very high up in in that um, you know, figure, and we we're seeing a number of, of younger people who are British nationals coming in, and they they've been tricked into moving drugs around. So county lines has been some of the the, the reasons for it. Um, we have uh, victims from um, Vietnam, China, um, Iran. Um, and, and, and other countries um, in Europe as well. 
the hit so country. So you just mentioned sex trafficking, and I think a lot of us will go immediately that this is all about sex. But there's other reasons that people are trafficked, are there? Absolutely, yes. So, so we're finding that forced criminality this this last few you know months is 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 significantly growing. For, forced criminality. Yes. What, what do you mean? So, so that will be where somebody again is is being um, encouraged to move drugs around okay. um, the country. Um, or um, other other ways of, of accessing goods so that their 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 slave master can can benefit from it really, um, but there's also domestic service. So we have um, women in particular who've been brought in who've who've been really used as slaves in in, in homes and in houses. Um, we have men who again don't want to be gender specific, but but they are um, tending to be men who who are caught up in cannabis farm growing. Um, so we have we have we have instance of that, um, and um, and there's other there's other ways that, that somebody can just feel that they've been enslaved, especially if they've they've been promised a salary or promised some work, and it's not been given to them, or they're being controlled by the person who they've been employed by. So the money isn't coming to the individual, but it's going to others, and they never see that they're money, trapped. and they're trapped. Yeah. So. Somebody comes to us, referred mainly from the police, would that be right? Yeah, um, it can be, yes. So the police might do an operation and they, they will you know, discover that there's a group of people who, who are um, potentially victims. And then what we have, we have trained volunteers who will move and, and be, be um, able to drive a, a person from where they've been rescued to their place of safety. So they will be brought to our service if it's a, if it's a house or if it's, if it's outreach. And then we will assess their needs and we will welcome them with the welcome pack and, and start to help them feel comfortable and safe, um, really. Um, prior to that, that, we do also have volunteers that work with us um, as a first responder. We're a first responder organisation. Um, and what will happen with, with those individuals, the volunteers, they're trained to support a, a potential victim to tell their story. So it can be captured, it can be recorded, and then sent to the, um, the authority to make the decision and to help them understand, is this person truly a victim um, of modern slavery or maybe there's another another cause for them to be brought into our service but our volunteers our first responders and then um, we we care for those individuals whilst they're waiting for the, the decision to be made and they're given opportunities to to learn to 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 study to um, take part in different activities and just to rebuild their lives and if they need counseling or so anything just else briefly tell me about the survivor support fund yeah, that, that's actually really important because obviously with Under the Contract, we, we are given money to help you know, support our, our, our survivors, but we find that there's other things that, that a survivor might like to do. So the Salvation Army, through the help of, help of people who've donated and, and um, given money, we use that money to help our survivors. So we've been able to help survivors um, uh, learn, um, do some sort of art therapy. Um, we've just had an application through for somebody who would like to actually learn to drive um, lorries and become a long distance lorry driver. She, she, she drives big trucks, but she wants to do that. Um, we've, we also have um, individuals coming who, who've been branded, tattooed by their, um, their slave master and they want their, those tattoos removed. And the so, Salvation Army donors support that fund, absolutely. is that correct? This absolutely. is very specific Salvation Army donor funding. Absolutely, so, so, yeah, oh, that's it's great. invaluable. Thank you. So if questions are coming up, do, do pop them into the, the comments box there. Now we have a, a privilege of having a, a survivor with us today, Dan, uh, but here is Dan's story uh, on video. He seemed a decent person at first. He seemed a decent bloke who had a lot of good things in his life and I didn't at that time. He was so popular with everyone. He was driving around in nice cars and he was just became my friend. He'd take me for meals and stuff like that. It was all really nice. The boss of the company I was working for was his best friend and they had con complete control over the payroll situation. At first it was to do with some money that he gave me, then it went to more money because I couldn't pay him back. I couldn't escape it, I suppose, because both of them was always knew exactly how much money I'd have, when they could take it, what hours I'd be working. It was just a never-ending cycle of me just giving him money and if I said no, the threats and the violence and stuff would come. If there was weekends to work, they made me do them. Like most weeks, I was working 75 hours. It was around 50,000 pounds. He said that I owed him. He, he used to 
did deal drugs. And there have been times when he was making me deal drugs, but I didn't want to do it. I cried to him and just begged him, like, can I just, can you stop doing this to me? It deteriorated to the point where I tried to commit suicide at one point and overdosed with the tablets. It wasn't just threats of uh, mental like, abuse, it was also physical. The scars across my head where he was hit by, and the teeth where he knocked my teeth out. But it was the threats of violence towards my loved ones that, like, when someone tells you that they're going to beat your mother up, that is, no man, no woman ever wants to hear that. He just made me feel terrified. He wanted somebody to do whatever he wanted him to do. And that was his way of feeling powerful. It's difficult to, to say that I was a slave. That sounds terrible, it feels terrible. But I, I was and he made me to be there. But I'm thankful I got the opportunity to escape. To be honest, the day is a bit of a blur for me. We was all like, arrested and I was handcuffed and there was just police everywhere. They did all the searches, they found all the drugs and stuff. It was, at first I was scared of thought like I was going to be in trouble and getting done. Uh, then I was took into uh, the station. Instantly straight away, did knew what was happening and I was given help. They released me I just, with, with the other people to make it look like I wasn't helping the police with the inquiries. I got a phone call and he just said, have your bags ready for the morning. And yeah, they, they took me and that was the, the last time I seen anybody from that life. I remember leaving my parents' house. They took me halfway across the country, two volunteers from the Salvation Army. Uh, then drove me the rest of the way, which was quite a long way. And I was so scared, I was terrified of what, what was gonna happen to me now. And these two ladies was just so lovely, really kind, generous people. They actually talked to me and just like, made me believe that I was a, I was a good person. And they made me, they made me feel that a little bit stronger on that first night when all I wanted to do was cry. Things got better from there onwards. I just positively rebuilded. But that's through the help that I got. I learned to cook, to put a chest, to do my washing. I feel like I miss everybody. I miss everything. But they saved my life completely. With the everything from being housed, clothed, sometimes even at first like fed. Like everything the Salvation Army did for me was amazing. Everything they completely just got me from down the bottom, being terrified, to getting me into a university. I'm now studying. I've also got a full-time job and I'm getting better. I feel like if it wasn't for the Salvation Army, I would be in a completely different place in my life now. Well, that's a, that's a powerful story and I'm so grateful and privileged to be able to uh, welcome Dan. Dan, we've, um, we're disguising your, your, your face, your voice, so you we just want you to feel very safe here with us. But thank you so much for being willing to uh, come and chat with, with us today. It's been great to meet you uh, uh, earlier and, and have a bit of a chat. Dan, can you just tell me why, why are you doing this today? Why are you speaking about this? Uh, I'd like to raise awareness on, on the matter. And hopefully if I can raise awareness and somebody sees this video or hears about what you guys do, that can fix them and it's one less person that goes through what I went through and that makes the world a better world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, when we were chatting, Dan, you, you said to me that, that it, it's, it's still very, obviously very painful. Uh, how, how, why do you think you got caught into this? What, what happened? Uh, I think I was just young, naive, looking up to a bad person and thinking that having everything, materialistic things, makes you a better person. Whereas now I'm just grateful for every day, as opposed to somebody who's happy for materialistic things like having money and being a person of high regards. Yeah, 
Absolutely. You know, you and I were chatting. I, I think the powerful thing about, about, about you, Dan, especially for our viewers now watching in their, in their homes and offices across the UK, is that you're a normal bloke. You know, you're, you and I have just been talking about the dreadful England cricket performance this morning. So I mean, we can talk about normal stuff. And, and I, I suppose it's that, that normal life that, that we live. And, and then you get caught up into this. So how are you feeling now? How are, you, how, how are things going? It's, it's a million times better than what it was, but it's still difficult. Some days are good, some days are bad, but I'm getting better now studying at university. I have a full-time job. Started to grow into a better person. Yeah, you were telling me about studying business, which is fantastic, and you're ready into your second year, so you're, you're doing really, really well with that. So just just one more question from me, and then we'll, we have people, if you want to send your questions into Dan, you're welcome to do that. But Dan, if you could have a chance of going back and talking to your younger self, maybe there's somebody watching today who's a youngster and, and they think it could never happen to me. What, what, would you, what words of warning would you give them? I'd just never trust somebody who's a bad person. Anyone who's evading the law is a bad person. The police helped me so much when they rescued me. And I just, I feel like I'm a bit stuck for words. No, you're doing great. No, you're doing well. Yeah. No, thank you, Dan. You've done really well. And, and we, we'll, we'll come back to you perhaps with a, with a question a bit later. Cathy, when you listen to Dan's story, is that typical? It is, yes. Um, so, so people are, are tricked and conned into to doing and, and um, getting, getting involved in something where they think it's going to benefit and actually it doesn't and it, and it, 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 it hurts. It's, I mean, the, the experience of Dan, the, the fact that he was treated in the way that he was, is, is typical, um, of, yeah. sadly, of, of so many of the people that we, we look after. And you can actually see Dan there working through, I, I guess, his frustration with himself. You yeah. know, for being caught. How, how did I get myself mm. into that? And and the the criminals who who do this are very clever because yeah. they do paint a picture of something that's better and an opportunity that that, that they give to somebody. And um, but what happens, as Dan's experience, is that that you get into debt and and then they hold that against you and suddenly it's not just against you but it's against your family. And there's so many people who who are in that experience they can't pay back what they're what they they're told they owe. So if you're watching at home now, what what can people do to help? Well, I think from from the, the public's perspective, it, it's been it's being very aware that this is happening around us, as, mm. as we've we've heard and seen, and and to to raise concerns if you're at all concerned about somebody who who might be seemingly controlled by somebody that they're with another person and they seem to be you know look, looking quite poorly malnourished, is to contact the police. Um, you know, I've done it myself. I've phoned the police because I've seen somebody coming out of buildings at, at unusual times of the day, you know, early in the morning, um, and I've contacted the police and and they. Then they then follow it up. Um, yes. So certainly do that, um, and also just just you know if if you're ever if you're wanting to volunteer and you're wanting to help and you're wanting to be a part of the work we do, then contact us because yeah. you know there's training, there's support available, but but also you know we, we need that support. And if you want to raise any money, um, you know we've had people do parachute jumps and and all sorts of um, weird and wonderful things, um, you know run marathons and, and everything. But it, it's great because it means that our survivors support. For and continues to grow and we can money, help people. That Absolutely. extra money we can give. Well, one of the things we all need to do is, is take this seriously and get educated. And here's a video now about how to spot the signs of trafficking. Modern slaves can be hard to spot. Demand for cheap goods, cheap labor and cheap sex has created the perfect storm for human trafficking. In the UK, it's estimated there are nearly 13,000 women and men being forced into a life they didn't ask for, with more people being discovered every day. You probably come into contact with them without ever realising. There can be some telltale signs, though. Sometimes they might be physical. They look uneasy, unkempt or malnourished, or have untreated injuries. Sometimes the signs can be less obvious. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So please help us help them. If you suspect slavery is happening, contact the Modern Slavery Line. Or if a victim needs support, call the Salvation Army and play a part to help stamp it out.
Well, there's some important information there for us to remember. Now we've been joined, Kathy and I have been joined by Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Hi. Welcome. Now, you have started working with the Salvation Army relatively recently during yeah. lockdown. Tell yeah. us what you do. Yeah, so I'm the programme coordinator for the London Outreach Service here at the Salvation Army. And we're a relatively new service, so we've been open since October 2020. And our role is to support adult victims who are victims of human trafficking and modern slavery, but who don't need safe house accommodation. Okay, so, so we, then they can stay in their own accommodation. So they might be in asylum accommodation, or they might be living with friends and families, or in private or local authority accommodation, but they still need support. Yeah. Now, started in September, we're October, October. Yeah. we're in March. Yep. How's it going? It's busy. The demand for this work is um, it's huge, wow. to be honest. We, we've been going about four months rough, roughly now. So we've had and supported over 116 clients. And I say over because I am sat here, but the referrals are still flooding in. We are still supporting people. And just to give you an example, last week we had 14 referrals in five days. Okay. So that's the demand. So let's talk about where do the referrals come from yeah. and then what do you do to help those people when they come into your care? Yeah, absolutely. So we get a referral from the contract office team, which Cathy talked about, and we will get a referral in and we will at that point step in to support that client. And that support is really varied. Every individual has their own story, they've been through their own experience, and therefore we need to tailor that support individually. But it's helping them and facilitating them to engage in their ECAT entitlements. So the things that Cathy mentioned earlier, like getting a solicitor, going to the GP, and there are so many barriers to accessing those. So let me tell you a bit of a story. We've Please. got a client who, her mental health was really poor, and she really needed support with that. And I, we sort of suggested, why don't you go to the GP? Why don't we talk to your GP about this? And because of the culture she'd come from, she was horrified at the thought of that. She thought she would be laughed out or locked up because of saying that she was suffering with mental health. And so we were able to support her. We called the GP with her. We went with her. And I'm so pleased to say that her mental health is now stable. But that's because we have a creative team who help break down some of those barriers for supporting these clients. So you've got a base in central London yep. and you've got a team of people. Yep. Explain what are the qualifications well, for, for your role or for the people who are working? What, what level of, of, of uh, skill are we bringing to this? Yeah, so we have a team who go through uh, really in-depth training. That's, that's the main thing, is that we, we employ people who are good at talking to people, who have good communication skills, who have real empathy and care, who can build a rapport with someone who needs support. And then we put them on some significant training and it's intensive and it's a lot of information, don't get me wrong, but it's really important that we make sure that we are giving these clients the best support that we can. So you're functioning in COVID, yeah. you're trying, dealing with a pandemic, but you're actually seeing people face to face. Yes. Uh, so we are we are being client led in this season. I think that's the best way to be. So for clients who are too nervous to come out, understandably so, we are doing over the phone contact. So we're still supporting them. We're still doing everything that we can, but we're just doing it over the phone in this season. For other clients, they might not have a safe space at home to talk through what's going on. They might not feel like they can talk about it at home. And so Therefore, we are still inviting them in. We are still seeing these clients. We are just using PPE. We are doing social distancing. But, you know, if a client wants to be met, then we will meet them because we are working with them. Thank you very much, Jenny. Those fantastic uh, answers and, and your empathy comes through. You've, you've got great communication skills. Kathy, we've got some of our questions coming through here. So, and I'll, I'll bounce them between you. And, and it's also good to have Dan on the, uh, on the line there as well. A question from Elaine Humphreys here. How do you become a first responder or a counsellor for survivors of human trafficking? Well, if, they, if, if somebody wants to become a first responder, they would contact um, our team and then we would um, talk with them and, and uh, explain the role and then they would go through some training, some quite, again, vigorous training to understand what modern slavery is and then they would be able to um, work with us as a volunteer. Thank you. And another question's come here, and I'll, I think, Cathy, you'll get this one. You mentioned the Survivors Support Fund provides 
help with education activities. Can you give some more examples of what that fund could be used for so that donors would know where their, what their money's being used for? Yes, um, so we, we have also been able to support um, individuals for the, the, the deposit for a house. So again, when they're moving on, on in our, out of our service, they need to have that deposit, they don't have that money. So we've been able to, to, to provide that. We've also been able to provide um, um, a bicycle for, for somebody who actually wanted to, 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 to use a bicycle. We've also been able to provide support for, for, for people within this, well not this period, but before COVID um, to, to exercise, so to join a gym and, and have that sort of um, social interaction and also to keep well. Um, we have children who are coming to our service with, the, with their parent um, and very often they need um, support and help so we will also provide toys and equipment for, for a child. Um, clothes, you know, as I said, people come into our service with just the outfit that they're wearing so they need, um, they need a selection of, of clothing so we will also be able to support them in that way. Um, we've been able to um, provide um, support for, for houses in, in, in sorting out with their, in their garden, giving them horticultural experiences. And so the fund has been able to help um, develop a garden space so that, again, the clients can, can use that space to relax in, but also grow and, and help that within their own therapy. Thera it's very therapeutical, and that's been able to help them too. Now, you did say there you would give someone help with a deposit for a house. I think you meant help with their rent. We're, we're not buying houses. No, 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 oh, no, sorry. No, no I right. didn't. They, was, I, 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 they all got excited in my <laughs> ear. They thought that we were. We were, we were, we were, we were um, Dan, I got, a, I got a, a bit of a question here. I, I hope you'd be okay with it. Uh, two parts. Uh, one was how did the Salvation Army help you, the workers help you? But another question just come in have you, Are you able to see any of your family from your previous life? Uh, so the Salvation Army supported me with everything from essential like medical needs up into helping me to learn how to wash my clothes and cook and just things like they helped me get into university to secure a job. And the second, uh, the, the answer to your second question is uh, no, I haven't seen my family for as long as I can remember now. Yeah, no, well, that's that's really that's really tough for you. And uh, yeah, again, Dan, I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. You've been absolutely fantastic. Um, let me just ask you this question, Jenny, and maybe Kathy, you want to jump in as well. But you've mentioned increase in British nationals being trafficked. Um, are, are we seeing any British nationals leaving the country? Do either of you know that, whether people are being trafficked out of the UK or is it really within the UK? Either of you know that, Kathy? Um. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I, 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 I anticipate I, I feel it's more that the, the British nationals are being moved around in the country. From the stories that we're, we're, we're hearing, um, it's more around um, young people, um, as I said, being involved in drug trafficking, um, and that's within the country. Um, we, we have had a situation where somebody who is in another country who was British and was, was being trafficked and wanted to come home here. And we were able to, with our international team and the work we do as a Salvation Army globally, we were able to support that person to come back um, and, and, and get the help they needed. But we were also able to do it the other way when somebody was in our service who was from another country and we were able to support our colleagues in the Salvation Army abroad and, and help that person move back to their um, home country, hometown, and reintegrate back into the community. Yeah, not everybody knows that about the Salvation Army, that you know we work in the 130 countries around the world. And I think that's our great advantage when it comes mm -hmm. to some of this trafficking yeah, yeah. work, that you, know, you can pick up the phone and speak to somebody yeah. in another part of the world, yeah. you know, and, and they, can, up really and they, well. can, they mm -hmm. can meet them off the, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, another question here, um, what, what about Scotland and Northern Ireland? Are we able to do anything for them? Well, we, um, we don't have a contract in the same way in Scotland. That, that's held by another um, charitable organisation, but it's the same sort of support, outreach and, and safe houses. But we do, have a, um, we do have a work that we are doing to support survivors in, in Scotland. So we have a, a key contact person um, who is making the, the networking um, opportunities to ensure that, that we, we can um, help somebody when they're identified. And there are other charities up there that we're also making links with. So in, in Scotland, you know, that, that, that work is growing. Um, and similarly in Dublin, um, sorry, in Northern Ireland and, and also even in, in 
Southern Ireland. Um, we, have, we have people who are working to support people um, who are victims of, of modern slavery and trafficking. But again, it's not as joined up as, as maybe we're doing here in England and Wales. Yes. Um, but that, that is developing because that's part of the role that I have to ensure that we can um, have a joined up approach uh, across the, the UKI territory. So Jenny, a question here, just a bit more about the work you've been able to do during COVID and some of the challenges you've had. I think you were telling me earlier about iPads. Yeah, so one of the challenges we've had is that uh, lots of external agencies have gone online, understandably, in this season. However, lots of our clients do not have access to tablets and uh, devices to be able to access that. And so actually we've used the Survivor Support Fund loads. It's been uh, essential, I can't express how important it's been for us to be able to use that to get tablets. You know, we've got a client who was really excited about starting a course. She was so excited that this course was about to start and then suddenly COVID hit and they were like, don't worry, the course is online. But that, that didn't work for her. She couldn't still access it. But thankfully, with the help of the Survivor Support Fund, we got her a tablet and she is going to start next week. That's, that's brilliant, Jenny. Now, this is your last chance if you've got any questions. They are coming through on my phone here, so thank you very much for those of you who've sending them in, but we can do with a couple more call, uh, uh, messages, but this will be the last opportunity. Um, now, I talk so much, I forgot what my question is. Here we go, Jenny. There's an anonymous question come in, and really, I think what they're asking here is what's the difference between what the government provides and what we, as the Salvation Army, provide? So what's the added bits that we give? But let's also explain what the, what the taxpayer's contribution is to all of this work. Well, um, so, so the government, in, through, through the work that we're doing, um, they, they, are, they are helping us to provide the safe house support and the outreach support, um, which is, is, is key. Um, but but as, as a Salvation Army, what we're able to do is to provide the, the volunteer support and the, also the, the, the overall care and, and um, pastoral support through our chaplaincy, but also through to training our volunteers to work within our, our core settings and our church and, and other settings, and also to help with the, the, the first responder role, the driver, the chaperone role. Um, and then as a Salvation Army, we have our own safe houses, um, and we also have, have our outreach. And although some of that's funded through the government, there's so many extra um, parts to that. So with the Survivor Support Fund, that's a Salvation Army um, fund that we, we use to help um, within this area of, of work. Um, and, and, and wider, it, it, it's, it, it's growing. So, so it, it's, it's really, you know, endeavouring to get people, to help people become more aware and to help them get involved. And so, I, yeah. mm. and I know we've also had support from corporates, corporations have helped Absolutely. buy a safe house, Anglo-American Corporation, and also uh, and we've refurbished them. and refurbished them and, and really help us out with that. And also many trusts and foundations have been very generous in, in that respect. Um, Kathy, you know, the Salvation Army is a Christian church. We come out of that with our Christian motivation towards appreciating people. How do you find your Christianity affects the work that we do? Well, as, as a Christian, I, I believe that, that God has a purpose for my life. And, and I do feel that, that all the preparation prior to coming into this role has actually prepared me for this. Mm. Um, and, and at times it feels very, very big. And, and uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a big job. But at the same time, I, I do believe that, that God has equipped me to help me to, um, to direct the teams that we have and to direct the work that we're doing. But, but I, I believe God's a God who loves and, and who's created individuals and he's watched over them as they've been created. And people, because of their life situation and because of what's happened to them, have then unfortunately been used and abused by others. And therefore I feel that, that for, for me, as a Christian, it's so important to help a person understand that they're valued by God, they're seen as, 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 as um, as beautiful in his eyes and therefore I feel that the, the, the work we're doing and the support we give an individual in, in their recovery helps them to feel that they are of worth and that they can have a life and some hope. And Dan, you and I were talking a few moments ago and you reacted really strongly. Tell me what you said to me when I said to you, how do you feel like when they, someone says you're a slave? I just feel the word slave is such a horrible word. It gives me shivers down my spine. And I also believe that people just think slaves are from different countries, different continents from 200 years ago. It's happening around the corner from everybody's house. Yeah. And it should be addressed a lot more.
Absolutely. And, and I think, Dan, what you are is a survivor. And, and it's that, uh, Kathy was talking about our valuing every person. You know, we believe people are made in the image of God and, and people should not be treated the way you were treated. And, and I just want to say what a privilege it has been to, to meet you this today and to see your resilience and, and you are truly a survivor. And I just wish you, I'm sure the people at home will want me to just really thank you for today and wish you every, all the best and every strength as you, as you go on and, and, and rebuild your life and, and, and thrive, you know, really thrive, buddy. Um, being fantastic. Friends, I hope, you've, um, I hope you've found this as powerful as I have. It's been really good to be with you for the last... 40 minutes and um, if we haven't answered your questions and they're in the link we will try to get back to you on those. We're going to be uh, back again for another Frontline Live in June and so we'll communicate that and advertise that widely but uh, I want to thank our guests, thank you to Dan, thank you to Kathy, thank you to Jenny, thanks to the team to have technically put this together and thank you, you, thank you to you, thank you for the support you give the Salvation Army, thank you for your service, Thank you for your prayers and God bless you until we meet again. Goodbye.